Okay, so thank you, Neil Maskell, for joining me today. Um, just want to start with Ball is coming out, well, it's coming to uh, London Film Festival soon. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with the film? Um, I met, I think I met Paul Andrew Williams through Johnny Harris, if I remember rightly, he's a, a dear friend. Years ago, off the back of London to Brighton, which was a film that I loved. Um, and then uh, Paul asked me to do, he was doing a video for James Lavelle, um, who was in Mo Wax and, uh, or founded Mo Wax and was in Uncle, that band with DJ Shadow. Um, he was doing a video for him and was like, oh, would you come down and do it? it had a bit of dialogue in it. It was one of those sort of pop videos maybe early 2000s, I suppose, <laughs> uh, mid 2000s, where there was sort of, there was a break in the music and there was some dialogue and stuff and it was me involved in this vaguely sort of confrontational scene. Um, so I did that. And then me and Paul stayed in contact and I went, he invited me to screenings of Cherry Tree Lane and a song for Marion and uh, both of which I think are great, very underseen films. And then, He'd sort of say, oh yeah, no, we'll do a film together. And actually I was with my voiceover agent having a coffee one day and I bumped into him and it was all very friendly as always. And we had a laugh and then he said, oh, and I've got something, I've got a film. And as he left, if I'm being honest, I said to Laura, who's my voiceover agent, I was like, he always says we're going to do something <laughs> together and we don't, you know. And, uh, and then quite soon after that, about a year after that, he sent me this and it was just like very flattering. And, um, and a really lovely part. And um, I've always wanted to work with him. He's a great filmmaker. Um, he's on the list, you know, so I-, I You I ticked was, him off. Oh yeah, exactly, really, yeah. You know, I'm very fortunate. I've got to work with sort of some of the most interesting British filmmakers and he's one of them. And, and this has been that really. Yeah. So, I mean, just looking at the, the, the schedule for filming and the location, so 18 days, 36 locations, was it an intense shoot? Was there pressure to kind of deliver on a first take thing? Uh, yes, it was incredibly intense shoot. And yeah, it, it, um, there is pressure to deliver on the first take. I suppose, is it, I don't know if I feel that pressure necessarily most of the time. You can get caught up sometimes. And, and, and I always find that at the point where you start, when your brain starts to become aware of the time that you have, you're in a bit of bother. And it does happen, it happens to me. Um, that, and then the panic sets in and, you, and you're not really thinking about the scene as much as you should be because you're worrying about how much time you've got to actually shoot it. Um, and you have to really try not to think about that, you know, and, 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 and try to just be in the part as much as you can be. Um, so yeah, it does bring pressure, but it also it gives momentum. You know, when you're working at that pace, you start on day one really working at that pace and it's, you know, and, it, and you quite grow energetic. used to it quite quickly. And yeah. I've done a lot of films in very short spaces of time and stuff. So, um, so you're so kind I'm of experienced within bit, that yeah. kind of filmmaking kind of process. Ready, you know. ready to go at any moment. Um, so yeah, but it is, it, uh, and it, but it also means it's quite immersive because you don't have the, the hanging around and the sitting around that you have on other parts. So while, yes, it, you're short of time and takes maybe, you also don't have the gaps between takes where other doubts can come nagging in. And, and you know, it's weird even like knowing your dialogue. You can know your dialogue and then you can arrive on, you know, a bigger thing and it's like four hours of sitting there and it all starts to evaporate and you become less certain of what you're doing. So actually, sometimes it sort of works in your favour as well. It's a bit weird that. That's yeah, so the case. a complete kind of focus. Yeah, and you become sort of lost in it a bit. You know, it's, it's sort of easier to stay in it uh, in a way. Was it filmed during lockdown? Was it filmed yeah. during COVID? Yeah, we shot down in Dartford um, and then on Barry, on Barry, Barry Island, Island in Barry Island yeah. in Wales. Um, and yeah, it was all in. It was all during COVID, and they sort of had a lot of COVID protocols in place. And Dominic Ty, who was the producer, was really on top of that. Um, a very small group of uh, uh, sort of people working in production that had to be across it, and they did an amazing job actually. Of, uh, of, because no one got it, no one got the COVID, and everyone was monitored all the time. And the crew were brilliant at like keeping their masks on and, and keeping distance as much as they could. They can't always, but yeah, as much as they could. Yeah, it's problematic. And the yeah. Juan A, who was the um, 
the first on it was was you know it's like another level the first assistant directors during this period have really it's the hardest job on a film set anyway running the set and keeping things running and to have this extra layer of difficulty and making sure that people are sanitizing hands and keeping their masks on and keeping their masks over their nose and stuff like that it's it's astounding how these um practitioners have, have managed to kind of keep it up and i can't imagine the pressure and the sort of emotional stress they must feel at the end of the day because as well people get the um you know you, <laughs> you hear people going oh for god's sake because they're trying to do their job and someone's there going hands mask you know <laughs> Um, and it, they don't want to be doing that, and um, and they're they're sort of forced to, and they, they're, it's incredibly admirable actually. So it sounds intense, positive, um, maybe not necessarily kind of a fun or enjoyable, but I just wondered, you know, thinking about the character of Bull and looking at your CV with roles you've had in Kill List and Utopia, and you know, and even from. Um, yeah, Football Factory, Rise of the Foot Soldier. You know, you've kind of got a reputation for playing violent men, you know, or dark characters. Yeah. And I wondered, you know, what was that the attraction of playing this character ball? You know, yeah, is that what attracted you to kind of, you know, to taking the script, apart from like working with Paul as well? Well, yeah, I mean, when something's written for you like that, it's. Um you know, it's that as much as anything, and as long as it's good, you know, yeah. it was good. Um, uh, so no, it isn't necessarily because I'm, you know, particularly attracted to playing darker roles or to, to, to playing violent roles or whatever. Um, for some reason, that's been my casting, maybe, and what people want me to, to do, whether how much that's to do with my accent or what I look like, you know. It's that expressionless know. face that you have sometimes. Maybe, yeah. I mean, when we were doing Paul, Paul kept, he always thought I was angry with him. And I think my thinking face or my resting face or whatever <laughs> it is to some people clearly looks like I'm very angry or whatever. <laughs> I find it quite strange because my nature isn't particularly aggressive. I don't think, I hope not. So um, these characters are really different from you yeah, yeah yeah i think so yeah and how do you prepare for um roles such as as bull um, or how do you prepare for your roles generally you know what what's your do you have um a process approach to yeah acting? well I, when i'm getting ready to play a part what i try and do is do as many things that make me think about the part as i can because like everyone i have a tendency to procrastinate I can just, you know, sit on my phone or, or, and, and Google pointless things and read the newspaper and, you know. Um, so I sort of have to find different ways to make sure that I'm always thinking about the part. And it can be quite strange. I'll go and look at, you know, art that necessarily isn't necessarily seemingly linked to it. But I'm looking for things that might spark ideas about the part that I'm about to play. I'm not just going to look at an exhibition. I'm looking. I'm sort of looking at an exhibition, thinking, "Where is this guy in that?" And it's kind of just to keep my brain on it, like focused. Yeah, focused yeah. on it, or or just yeah, to make sure that as much of my day is not procrastinating and it is thinking about what I'm going into. Um, and that can sort of be anywhere, you know, uh, whether I'm travelling on public transport and I'm looking at people and the way they are, but I'm looking through it, looking at it through the prism of like the part I'm about to play and whether there's anything anywhere visually or, or in anything that I'm reading that might sort of trigger an, a different understanding about what I might do in different scenes or who the guy is or whatever. That's what I do. And it, it's, um, you know, I can, uh, I remember getting ready to do a film called Wasteland that was released as The Rise. And I was <laughs> and I was working with Vanessa Kirby. I was supposed to, I was playing a guy who was like, who was the the the, the villain of the piece really. And um but I was also in a state where he was sort of obs obsessing about this younger girl who was an employee who, who Vanessa Kirby was playing. And she was making fun of me because I was reading Anna Karenina. And, you know, that's about like obsessive unrequited love. Well, that's a big chunk of it. And I was sort of, I had these 
big sections of it highlighted for this British film that we were playing, where I was playing like a guy from Leeds who ran a nightclub. But it's that, it's just, and often it's things that I'm interested in anyway. It might be, you know, films that I want to see anyway, a book I want to read anyway, an exhibition I want to look at anyway. But instead of just reading it, seeing it, watching it, listening to a piece of music, I'm trying to apply those things to the plot. And um, it's a good way of combining getting through the stuff you want to absorb in your life anyway and also hopefully preparing. It's like multitasking. It's a bit like multitasking. <laughs> multitasking for a busy, a busy yeah, guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I mean, so it sounds like you almost like build layers or when you're looking for something, you don't know what it is until you find it, that spark. But when you're then on set... Is there, in terms of, like, I've either working with Paul or people like, you know, Ben Wheatley or Jared Johnson you've worked with or any director, how how do you like to, do you like to be directed as an actor when you're on set? And has that, as you've as you've kind of gone through your career, has that changed at all? Um, yeah, I think I've found in general, my best experiences have been with directors who sort of leave you alone a bit. And that confidence is a big part of it. And the more sort of granular the notes you get, and the more like, change on this, do that, and change that, um, that becomes an enormous distraction, actually. I and mean, you can end up, you're in the, all the way through the scene, and you're thinking, oh, he wants me to think about that word, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> Um, that I don't find particularly helpful. And probably the older you get, the more clear you are, I keep saying you, I shouldn't, the more clear I've become in, um, in what I find helpful or not. But then I've worked with directors who, who, who work in sort of quite micromanaged stuff that have been interesting to work with. Um, but yeah, probably uh, as, I've, as I've got older and the more people that I've worked with and the more work that I've done, the more I've sort of felt that I'm most effective with nudges and like they might ask me just one question or something to feed into a scene, then then the, the, then that kind of, of micromanage direction. Lots of notes, you know. Yeah. I mean, I hear about directors who do that, and I, and and some of the you know the very best directors whose work I admire a lot. And I just think, I don't know. I think, Would that put you off, you well, know? I was talking actually, Tom Burke, who I've just directed um, in my thing, we were talking about it because of a director he'd worked with. And we both were agreeing that it's all right to get a lot of notes if you're then going to get a lot of takes because you'll get there. But it's not okay if there's one more take and you get 10 notes because it's just overwhelming and confusing and distracting and baffling and that, that's so, so if it's like a Mike Lee process where they just kind of, yeah, you know, um, exactly. you know they there's kind of time. build up, there's time, time, you know, and yeah. there's a there's a point where you're, you know, to that whole process. So that's yeah. fine, but just for one take for you, it's you're like, it sounds like you need, you like a director who has confidence that you could just do play the role yeah like to feel the confidence the director's yeah, confidence like to feel in that you. they're confident in you and that you're confident in what you're doing and that even the process of receiving a note or developing a scene is collaborative rather than directing yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly okay. I think for me okay yeah. yeah I was just interested about how you work on set yeah. and talking about you know performances when I've only seen the trailer for Ball. <laughs> and I'm just thinking about your performance, that small part that I've seen of you in the, in the trailer. This seems to, it feels more of a performance, um, as in it feels, all the experience you've had of playing kind of violent men, you know, um, you're given the space in this film. And I, I wondered whether A, it's because it's, your character kind of pulls the film through. So, you know, there's a lot, you know, this, this film is a lot about you. Whereas like with Kill List, although you're the main protagonist, you had Michael Smiley um, with, and, you know, you've worked in films where, you know, even in Utopia, there was, it was a kind of multi-character, you know, um, yeah, film, but here it's just you, but it feels, you know, just like how, 
you know, that scene in the car where you say on the big bad wolf. Um, and that closing line, the tra- you know, of the trailer is like things to do, my son. You know, there's a real nuance. It just feels really expansive. And I just wondered if you felt that about that, you know, it felt, you know, you had the space to kind of play with things a bit more. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that before. Um, so making you reflect really early on. No, on, but that's good. That's interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, Ball is also about a sort of milieu of people. Um, and he's actually, as much as anything, about the place where it's not, not dark for the such, but like the idea of the place that is at the end of the tracks and people that are at the end of the line and are sort of forgotten by... It's kind of liminal place, like fairgrounds yes. that live on the edges. Exactly. It's yeah. on the edge, it's kind of lawless. Hinterland. Um, a hinterland, yeah, that's a good, exactly a good way of putting it. Um, and so, it, you know, a ball is a product of that. Um, and I think actually someone who maybe had potential to be something else, but his environment, and particularly David Heyman's uh, character, Norm, who I think has been a big influence on his life since he was very young. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, he's, he's been sort of molded by circumstance. Um, so it's maybe slightly more, and, and you know, the, the, the group of people that were around me and around David, uh, and around Norm are a, a sort of ensemble as well, really. Um, but maybe it's about, yeah, it's about Bulls, how he reacts to those people and what, you know, he's obviously got a, a, a sort of vendetta, if you like, for want of a better word, against those people. Um, yeah, maybe, I, I suppose it is sort of shaped around him, but, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not really answering your question. But no, it's I, fine. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure what I was expecting to, yeah. to kind of get back, but it just, I think it kind of leads into my next question, as in um, when you, you know, is it important for you, as an, has it been important for you as an actor to develop, um, you know, over, you know, throughout your career, that like you've taken roles which has expanded or that have been challenging? Because it just feels like a big ball that, you know, you, if you're someone like me, kind of looks at people's careers and go, I can, you know, put a thread through. It feels like it's, you know, you've started, say, with kind of kill this and it's moved through. And this is almost like a um, oh, kind of a result of all those experiences of playing those characters. And you feel a bit more kind of relaxed into it. Or you're allowed a bit more freedom. But I was just wondering, you know, is it has it been important for you to develop as an actor? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. And and. And actually, that goes back to the thing we were talking about before, which is just confidence, really, you know, and, and just feeling like you, you're confident and comfortable on a set and, and, and that you can, um, that you're working with a director and not necessarily being the subject of the director. And, um, and, you know, from definitely from the early, from the earlier films I worked with, I worked on, um, Possibly you feel more autonomy and more control and like your own ideas. You're more confident about putting your own ideas, your own interpretation forward. And I think that's paying off. I don't know, maybe some (laughs) directors would say they wish that I was a bit more adaptable. (laughs) But do you think also, I mean, we'll come to talk hopefully a bit about this later, but do you think now that you come with um, a certain reputation, as in a good reputation, but, you know, as in everything you've been in kind of before that, I mean, you know, we would say that you're a pool, you know, in these films, like, you know, it's no masculine in these films. Yeah. Do you think you also can come with that reputation and that allows you a bit, like you said, a bit more kind of control over? Uh, yeah, I think so. But I think most actors, when you get to my sort of age, you know, and you've got a bit of work behind you and a, a reasonable CV or whatever, um, yeah, you come with... Uh, people they've got, they've got you for a reason yeah you know and it's not like you've gone through maybe like the casting process that you would have gone through as a as a younger man and where you are maybe a bit more subservient to what the director wants and, and you've been even through that casting process they've told you what the character is and what they expect from you and the casting director's chipped their bit in and not always usefully and um, 
uh, and and the, the the you know the director is looking for something very specific and really it's not about your interpretation so much as how close you are to the role in the first place um yeah that's definitely changed and evolved and and, and is where it is so that something like ball is you know as i say sort of pull i think sort of wrote that with me in mind and or developed it with me in mind and then yeah you do have a little bit more control maybe yeah Okay, so I mean, thinking about you, you know your career and your acting career, I mean, you know, you went to um, acting school from quite an early age, yeah. and like, throughout your whole you know teenage years, your acting school. And what got you into acting? I mean, is there anyone you know, like any actor or any kind of filmmaker who influenced you, and or you know, where did that kind of bug come from? Um, well, I went to Anna Shears in Islington um, from like eleven. Um, uh, and that was a sort of Friday night thing. It was a registered charity, and uh, we used to go on a Friday night and a Saturday afternoon to a group called the Young Professionals, which meant that there was an agency. So it was a community theatre, and, and you went for the rest of the week, sort of from Monday through Thursday evenings, and if they thought you might have a chance of getting a bit of work professionally, that then you were allowed to do Fridays and Saturdays afternoon, which of course we were all desperate to do. And um, Quite quickly, by the time I was sort of 12 or something, I was in that group, which was a big group, it was like 100 kids or something, um, ranging from seven up to 15, 16. And I met Peter Ferdinando there, who's still a very good friend, and who's the cousin of Gerard Johnson, who I've worked with a few times. And um, Peter was a huge influence on me and introduced me. He's a couple of years older than me, which means nothing now, but then. <laughs> Huge, you know. It's always a big when you're, when you're young, course, isn't it? It's you like, know, wow. When you're 12, yeah. 13 and your friend's 15, 16, you know. And um, he introduced me to Robert De Niro and the Scorsese stuff and that kind of New York method. That's, that's also Peter's training. And by the time he was 15, he'd begun that. He'd started training with Jack Waltzer, who's a, a very accomplished method acting um, school trainer from the lineage of the actors studio and stuff yeah. and I never went to those classes but um, they were in London they were in London yeah, as well he travels he yeah. teaches London, Paris oh, and LA okay. and New York Yeah. and um, Peter was involved in all that and that introduced me to that stuff and then through that over a lot of years you find a lot of other work whether it's sort of Cassavetes and people like that and actually a, a chaperone that I had on a job first took me to Mike Lee's um Life is Sweet, uh, which I went to see at the Hackney Rio when, uh, you know, God knows, 14, 15 or something, because she obviously saw something in me that I was interested maybe in, in, in different work, more diverse work than maybe kids of that age or a lot of kids of that age. Um, so that led me to uh, different actors and directors and that sort of sparked interest in me. Away from acting as a way to where just everyone's listening to you and that's nice and putting on a show, you know, which we all do, we all love to do as kids, or, or a lot of kids do, and I do. Um, so, yeah, that, that kind of brought me to taking it seriously as a, um, I nearly said craft then, God shoot me, uh, as a, you know, as, as a profession and as an art form that um, I wanted to be involved in for art's sake, you know. So it felt like, a, you know, uh, it, it could be a career, I think it's yeah. what you're saying. It sounds like you were kind of exposed to, um, you know, through your friendship with Peter, um, lots of different, you know, film directors, American predominantly, it sounds like, American film directors. Yeah, Casavetes right. is, you know, an interesting example of how a director acts, a, direct, a director directs actors as well. Yeah. Um, Mike Lee, um, but it, you and had then a sense Mike that Lee, Alan Clark, who was like a huge influence. Everyone at Anna Shears, like we worshipped Ray Winston, Phil Phil Daniels, who's been to Anna Shears. I Shears. wondered, yeah, yeah. 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 That, those they and Steve Sweeney, and um, you know the actors from that stable, uh, from Alan Clark's sort of stable, were so important to us, they were as important to us as the De Niro's and Pacino's and Pesci's and all that, you know, we, I remember like Ray Winston when he, he, he sort of, his career maybe didn't, it heated up again around Nil by Mouth and 
you know, when he was just doing bits of telly and like Peter ringing me because Ray was in the bill one night, you know, and, and so we got to see it. And we went to see Ray Winston and Tom Georgeson and Phil Daniels, Nigel Lindsay in um, Dealer's Choice. Um, uh, you know, bef way before Neil by Mouth, they were as much heroes to us as any of those American actors. And that was also like, oh, you can talk like us and have a career and be took seriously and, and do interesting work. Um, sort of vital work, you know, if you look at Clark stuff, The Firm and, you know, yeah, Jay Simpson, uh, Gary Oldman. Yeah, a lot, just tons of those actors. Mark Monero, who's now a friend, but, but was involved in that sort of stuff. Um, so lots of role models, is, I see. You lots know, of role models. Saying what you said, you know, um, I suppose, actors that sounded like you, yeah. or you sounded like them, that you kind of see, you know, presented as, this is a career choice I could actually do. I yeah. could actually, um, it isn't some, I suppose, airy-fairy idea. I can kind of, I could do this. That's what it sounds like, you know. Yeah. You know. So when, after you left, once you finished acting school and, you know, when you look at the 90s for you, it's, it seems like it's a long time for, you know, you've had bit parts in, in you know, TV. Yeah. And that's a long time to stay determined or focused or committed to a once, you know, pursuing, you know, an acting career. And I was just wondering, you know, are you determined? Were you, you know, how how were the nineties for you? But you know, yeah. are you were you um that's a lot of self-belief, that's what I was gonna say. That's someone who's got a lot of self-belief. It didn't necessarily feel like that at the time, if I'm honest. You know, Is it just me reading it? Yeah, so how did it feel like at the time? Well, I mean, I mean, by the time I was, I think I was either 18, I might have just turned 19, when I did a little bit in Neil by Mouth, that Oldman directed and, you know, Ray Winston and Kathy Burke were in. Um, Did that feel like even the small part feel like for you? Yeah, this is. I'm in a film. I'm in a film, and I'm in a film. On the big Gary Oldman. And I'm yeah. only nineteen. Yeah, you know, like uh, for uh, a lot of people have to go to drama school and come out. And by the time you know most people come out of drama school, they're 23, 24 or whatever. And by that time, I was you know nicking reasonable work, so it didn't feel like the wait was too long. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've been frustrated. At, periods of, you know, and I've had long layoffs where I haven't worked and whatever. What do you do in those long, how did you support yourself being, you know, like, so I think I read in an interview, you, you know, you did things like, you know, being an electrician or you just kind of did like manual work. Well, no, well, uh, I've got an electrician in the family and he would be, uh, he'd laugh at the idea of me <laughs> doing that. But I did, I did bits of, yeah, I mean, I had to uh, do, all sorts of jobs, but I mean, that was when I was sort of 18, 19, 20. And then I directed plays um, at a college that I'd been to, that I did theatre at. Is that in Dartford or yeah, out of Erie Yeah, it was a local Clay. college yeah. where they did plays. Um, and I went there and it was more like a theatre company, really. And so I went back and I could get, you know, I could direct a couple of plays there and earn enough money in between jobs sometimes to, or all the time to... So you're still quite busy then. So it's always busy, so, yeah. Yeah, so... And helping people on their stuff as well. You could get, you know, earn a few quid doing that. And I mean, as well, I was working at a time when if you did one advert, that might get you like 10 grand or something, you know, and that, which is not the case anymore. Um, and that would be enough. Or, and if you did that, an episode of The Bill, a couple of other things, you as an actor. And it was enough to kind of probably tide you over um, for a bit, which I, I think has gone now. I don't think that that's... Do you think things that the industry has changed that that's not necessarily kind like of possible? Like most industries, or, a lot yeah. of it now is about concentrating as much wealth in as few hands as possible. And so that means people at the bottom of the ladder, like jobbing actors and people who are playing small parts or, or doing advertising or whatever, um, they know there's a queue of people behind you and they're not going to give you any of it. Do you, you think know? it's harder now? I do, yes, I do think it's harder now. Mm. I think, and I mean, my, you know, my understanding of it is not great necessarily, but my impression of it is that, you know, you were at least remunerated then in a way that might see you through a few months of it then, of you then not working. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's the case. 
Okay. No. So it's not necessarily like if we looked at like your TV work, you you had theatre work. So yeah. you were you were busy, you were employed. Um, yeah, you could you do got fringe, the experience. Theater, you know, you, as I say, like, you know, if you did a couple of TV jobs, that would pay for you to do a fringe job that was profit share or something, where you f might feel more like you were getting the artistic expression and being an actor. Yeah. Um, than you were in those small parts in telly jobs, but it was the telly jobs that were paying you enough to, to do that. Um, so, so you, you yeah, took some um, jobs to kind of pay for the stuff that you wanted yeah, to do. Exactly, maybe, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and you were more likely to be given a big opportunity in a fringe play or something, uh, or you know, above a pub or whatever, than you, than you might be by you know, casting directors and whatever for, for TV. So, so it sounds like so it sounds like you had opportunities, yeah, you know, that it wasn't I worked with um, amazing people. Yeah. That, you know, are not heard of or not known of now and I did great work. Some of the best stuff I've ever done, it will be, you know, forgotten. In like the some of the best actors I've worked with. In the in the you know yeah, in, in, in the theatre of that time as well. In theatre yeah. and in shorts, you know, short yeah. films with directors that maybe didn't get the opportunity to go on we didn't have the right connections or whatever, and so I didn't get the opportunity to go on and make other work or, um, you know, even just working with people in class who were like amazing, were, was artistically edifying enough yeah. um, to keep you going. So it wasn't just a kind of bloody minded ambition or, um, that self -belief, self belief that was self belief, belief as such. really. You because know? you had, you it know, was seeing other people and working with other people and getting that edification, that soaking kept, it up. It sounds yeah, like you were just kind of, kind of continuing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, I, I couldn't necessarily take the credit for it because it was actually the people I was working with that were making, inspiring me, and, and making me keep going with it. Added to which, I have no other skills. <laughs> <laughs> so he's acting so I was like, what am I going to do? You know, as I said, I can't use these. You know, I'm absolutely useless. So. Sound like Paul Weller, music or nothing. Yeah, you know, really. Like... You know, I just am not able. I can barely, I'm always going through the wrong door, the wrong place. I can't, you know, I'm technically useless. I can't, I'm, I can't use a computer, you know, so. Wow. It was that or nothing, you know. So, I mean, talking, talk a bit about Football Factory or... Mm. It kind of feels like Football Factory comes along and just that kind of role and just that kind of film leads you into a lot of kind of work after that. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it, did, yeah. it seems to be like your career after that, so, you know, it seems to be so, an, an, a, a film that shifts your career somewhat in a, either in a certain direction or more film work comes along. And I was wondering, A, if that was the case or also, what, you know, when you look back, you know, what other films or what other people that you've worked with where you feel your career has kind of then accelerated a bit or taken you, developed your acting or shifted your career somewhat? So do you think The Football Factory is something that kind of has given you um, a certain kind of type, of type of role afterwards and did it shift your career? Yeah, it did, yeah. Um, Football Factory did for all sorts of reasons. Um, it put me in with a group of actors and people that were involved in other work and, and who then, you know, like anything, yeah, the, the, it's who you know stuff. So they would do stuff and recommend you for that part or for those. So I ended up doing a few films for Vertigo Films. Yeah. Um, they gave me the opportunity to do, um, it's all gone Pete Tong, for instance, which was different, a bit more comedic, which I think might have even been how what led to working with Ben Wheatley, because I think he saw that and liked me and then got me in the wrong door, which was a sketch show that we did. Um, uh, Frank Harper, who's a dear friend, um, he then was going off and doing other work um, in sort of, you know, underworld and, and gangster movies in the UK, and he'd always roll me in, mm -hmm. the expression that he would use, just um, roll Muscle in, you know. And, uh, <laughs> And so that probably led to like the Foot Soldier film. Although also I did a short film with Ricky Harnett, who's a close mate, um, called Swindles and Slim. Was that before or after, actually? I can't think. But um, I think that was before. And we did the Murder of Stephen Lawrence film for um, Paul Greengrass as well, actually. So 
that was a link that kind of led to that. But yeah, it's probably, I think amongst uh, the, the, the audience for Football Factory, so I suppose mainly young men, you know, uh, uh, who, who were buying that film and stuff, gave me a little bit of a status amongst, in those kind of films. Yeah. And then it was worthwhile people getting you in because you, you were probably another recognisable face that might make them get the DVD or, or or seek out the film or watch it. You know, oh, it's the it's another fella out of Football Factory. So no, it definitely opportune other work. Yeah, because it kind of feels like there's momentum. Yeah. you know, in whatever direction. <laughs> Yeah, what, for whatever reason, either it's like the people you've worked with that have given you opportunities yeah. or, you know, the audience or those kind of films. Because, you know, in the 2000s, films like Football Factory, Rise of the Foot Soldier, they yeah. all, you know, have a certain type of audience. Um, so it kind of feels you get momentum from that film. And it's interesting you mentioned about Ben Whitley and, you know, looking at a couple of your interviews, you, you spoke about the sketch, you know, how yeah. you began to kind of work with Ben Wheatley. And... Again, looking at your career, you've worked with Ben Wheatley multiple times and you've worked with Gerald Johnson yeah. a couple of times. And, you know, I think they're argu arguably two of the kind of most talented British directors at the moment or creative yeah. or... And I just wondered, A, what it is about working with those directors that kind of, you know, pulls you back every time. Is it, you know, they write a role for you or it's an opportunity or you've got a gap in your, you know, your diary and... You spoke earlier about kind of kind of working collaboratively, and I wondered with those two, or maybe especially with Wheatley, does it feel like a collaboration? Um, I mean, do you? I mean, I take it you enjoy working with these, yeah. you know, and you know you, the scripts are good. I mean, you know, especially I suppose with Wheatley, but yeah, yeah I mean, you know, are well, these like two both, directors you like working with? Yeah, uh, I mean, I haven't actually, I haven't worked with Ben or Gerard for a while actually. Um, I mean, other than Ben, as he exec produced my film, but not not as an actor, you know. Um, but both of them work in improvisation a lot, um, which is something yeah. I feel pretty comfortable with. Not every actor does. Um, I quite like working in improvisation, and I quite like working sort of comedically in improvisation as well. Um, whether I'm any good at it or not, I suppose is up for debate. But I do enjoy doing it. And both of those directors enjoy doing that as well. And like more with Ben, it's sort of, oh, don't know that, Gerard as well, like on set, on the day, you're improvising. Um, There's quite pressure then. Yeah, do, do you feel it? Do you look at it like it's pressure? Or is it, is it because you enjoy working in that way or acting in that way? It doesn't feel so much kind of pressure. Well, both, both Gerard and Ben, when you're shooting, it's quite immersive work. Or very immersive work, so you're not really, for want of a better expression, breaking character. The circumstances and the locations are real. You're working with other actors who are very highly skilled uh, improvisers and stuff, and um, so they both that that allows you to just be responsive. So I don't feel feel pressure really with that and like Gerard develops his stuff through improvisation a lot of the time so you work in improvisation before you start and then that some that can go further on set or whatever with Ben you do takes that are scripted then improvise then you go back to the script and, and mix the two and um, it's fun you, you yeah know, it sounds like you really enjoy it yeah as well as, as you know as well as being fruitful it's enjoyable um, so yeah, I mean, if you do start to feel pressure, it tends to go wrong. Actually, at that point. you know, that's when you uh, or when it's you like start too much, too much to, thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, you plan too much. You know, yeah. if you know the part by developing it in ways we were talking about before, yeah, and then you're arriving with your um, with your bags packed, you know. She's a Jeff Bell, uh, he always uses that expression, you know. Roll masculine in with his bags packed. Yeah, with roll masculine with his bags packed. That's going to be the title of your biography, you know yeah, that, don't, don't you? Yeah, well, I'm not sure there'll be too many people want to read that book. But, um, <laughs> yeah, like that's, if, you, if you've got your bag packed, um, then down. it should be, you know, you should be able to sort of uh, improvise and riff and, and, and explore, you know, the scenes like that. 
Good. So that's that, right. So with them, Johnson sounds a bit well, maybe not like Mike Lee. I think there's um, it starts before shooting and there's kind of work to be done kind of prior. Yeah. Maybe not as extensive as Mike Mike Lee. No but, different. Um, I mean, my, I haven't worked with Mike Lee, but I, my understanding like is he starts as nothing. Yeah, I suppose. I don't think he's going to make. I don't know if he's going to make any more films, Mike Lee. Um, I haven't really thought about it. Sorry, I, just put you on no, the spot. Yeah, well, I mean, I like you know, I'd like to work with all of the great directors that I've you know watched all my life. You know, be it him or Loach. I've, I was very. I mean, I think the loss of Alan Clark so young is. You wonder I what could have been. Think about that. Yeah. Still breaks my heart, and I'd like to think that maybe I was the kind of actor that he would have worked with. You know. Um, I wonder. I hope that Oldman makes another film at some point. Um, I mean, actually, Dexter Fletcher. It was a great experience on Wild Bill. He sort of, I think, brought some of those experiences that he'd had with directors like that with him, yeah. um, because that was a really collaborative and, and um, playful experience working with Dexter on Wild Bill. Um, Yes, I mean, uh, um, maybe, I, so as I say, I don't know entirely how much, um, like for instance, Gerard's work and, and Gerard's process is influenced by Mike Lee. Yeah. But yeah, he, he sort of develops work a lot earlier than Ben. Ben stuff is like, shoot, Ben works quickly. Let's go, let's start shooting tomorrow. You know, if you've got okay. an idea for a film, he's always like, shoot it. Go and shoot it. Uh, get raise five grand and shoot the whole film. You know that's what he says. Shoot it in your house. Just call the actors and get them in. That's how he works. Okay. Whereas um, Gerard stuff probably takes a lot longer to gestate, and there's more of a development period. But but they both know. kind of do improv. But you, the, yeah, both, yeah. But you obviously kind of like working, kind of, yeah. or like respond to that working yeah, kind exactly. of process. So talking about, thinking about your roles and, you know, you've worked with like Wheatley and Johnson and, you know, looking at your CV, I mean, always busy, um, or it, it feels like always working across short film, feature films, um, TV. And I just, I just wondered how much, uh, how much, con how much control have you had over roles you know saying yes to roles you know when you you know since say football factory is it just taking roles that have come along because you know that's that's what's on offer and you know i want to work so i'm just going to do this um has there been an element of decision making or um being able to say yes or no to roles at all you know do you you know has your career has your career been or oh, design yeah, by design, or is it just like random? No, I don't. I think it's pretty random. I mean, I you know, as I've got older, but I've probably got a little bit more control in terms of being able to, you know, decide what I want to do. Um, but no, really, I've just I like to work. Um, I like to be creative. So if I'm given the opportunity, I'll normally take it. Um, I know that there's certain things I don't particularly enjoy or I don't really like to do. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't hugely um, enjoy theatre as much probably, and particularly like a long run of something is not very attractive to me. Um, so, yeah, in, the, in that sense, I suppose I've chosen what it is I want to do. But in the main, I've just, I've liked to keep going and keep working. And I still feel like, well, it might be interesting. It's my usual. You can give it a go. Do you know what I mean? It might be something. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, it's like even when it comes to shorts and stuff, even now I'm going, well, I tend to go, oh, I can't do another short film. Just, you know, people don't watch them. There's loads being made. Uh, you know, it's all this effort and uh, uh, to for often, you know, films that find a very small audience and then you read the script and go oh okay but this is interesting <laughs> and then you speak to the filmmaker and they're really passionate and involved and you just go well all right yeah okay <laughs> you know it's only three days or whatever and you go and do it so um i wouldn't have it any other way than random really yeah but um yeah maybe I, i've got a little bit more but it's a little bit more by design as I've got a bit older, but I still do like to just keep working. Keep working. Yeah. I don't like big gaps, you know. Because it, when you look at your roles, you know, compared to some of your peers, say, and 
I'm going to name a few names. So people like, say, Danny Dyer yeah. or Craig Fairbrass um, and even Sean Harris. You're, when you look at your roles, you come across as someone who's a risk taker. Like you'd like, in, you know, that just in your, you know, in the kind of the roles you play or the kind of productions you've been in. And I wondered whether you saw yourself, you're looking at me like, no, I'm not risky. Well, do, do you think it's, you know, do you, maybe not, you don't think you're taking risks, but you don't play it safe. No, well, I don't, I think maybe, I, I like to think I take risks in performance. Um, I don't know about in career and also, I think sometimes some people appear to not having taken risks, but are just not given the opportunity necessarily. That's what I was wondering, you know. You know. So like, if you look, for instance, I mean, I haven't worked with Sean Harris, whose work I admire very much, but like Craig, who did Muscle with yeah. uh, uh, Gerard, you know, that's sort of outside of maybe the work that he'd normally do. And it was just being presented with the opportunity, I think, you know, that, that because um, I think he's very up for, for taking risks. And Danny, um, I think that most actors that I know, think Danny's one of the most underrated actors that we've got. Um, and not, un not even underrated, that isn't fair. He's sort of dismissed a lot of the time by the critics or the, the because maybe he was someone who kept working and did what was in front of him and, and you know, ploughed forward with the work that he was doing. And, you know, it's variable quality. So is my career, so is most actors' careers. But for whatever reason, and I would suggest there was an element of sort of classist um, uh, response to, to some of his work by prominent film critics and whatever, he, he wasn't necessarily given the opportunities. I mean, he got he did great, you know, Bolstall Boy's performance in that. Um, he's done all sorts of great work that, that, that isn't so well known or, or hasn't been highlighted as much as it should have been. Um, so while that might, it, it, I don't know, it could appear that way, I'm not sure that's actually reflective of, of my peers Career, yeah, no, I know, and that seemed to kind of put you kind of on the spot of saying, "Well, yeah, no, to... but I just, yeah, but I, like it, I to wondered... stand up for the people that I admire, you yeah. know, as well as that I've worked with." That's not just me talking for my mates either. Like, I don't, I haven't seen Dan in for years and years. I think we're very fond of each other, but I haven't seen him in years. But just, um, it upsets me. I think. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just thought that's why I wondered whether it was it's the lack of opportunity or, you know, you've just been presented with roles. So it would yeah, look like you're lucky. a risk taker, yeah. but actually it's just because the opportunities have been there. That good the fortune. Other, it's good fortune. Really so good fortune. Career built on good, good fortune. Yes. And it's interesting you mentioned about, you know, Danny Dyer and this idea of like working class, because the, the thing, your performances, the thing that really, well, A, your face, you know, I mean, think about Utopia or Cure List. There's something, there's something about your expressionist face which suits well to playing very violent men. But your voice is really distinctive and it's um, a certain kind of a, a London accent or a working yeah. class act, accent. And I just wondered whether, A, you ever think of yourself as, like, you know, a working class actor or that your career is kind of, seen as like um, a working class career because I think that's what you you know in terms of like Danny Dyer and how the critics respond it's you know there is an element of kind of classism I think within um, film culture British film culture but I just wondered whether you know if is class important to you has that changed over your career and what is it like for a working class actor in the British film industry um, it's all three questions in one. Yeah, no, uh, I think it, everyone's, I mean, uh, you know, uh, like you were just saying, you're given, the opportunities you're given are, can be pretty random and can come out of blue. And I think everyone has a very different experience in this game, generally, you know, unless you are sort of, you know, Eaton, Rada, Cambridge, uh, film star, you know, ge generally it's like, yeah, it's 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 um, it's about your your fortunes really, um, but 
definitely, when you ask sort of how important it is, there was a time when I would have said, oh, well, that's not, that's neither here nor there in my career. But now, actually, the older I get and the more I think about the films that sparked my interest and made me believe that I might have a go at it and stuff. Um, and the actors, you know, we were saying before, the, the Ray Winstons and the Phil Daniels and the Kathy Burks and the Tilly Vosbras and um, Steve Sweeney, who was massive, Jay Simpson. I suppose it is important. It's like, you know, that the, there's an expression that I came across in the last couple of years, which probably means it's very old. That's <laughs> like, you can't be it if you can't see it, you know? And I would love to think that someone who maybe might, who might not have thought there was a chance of them doing it um, because of where they come from or because of their accent or whatever, and or because of the innate snobbery of our industry, which I think's maybe shifted a little bit. Um, the, the idea that they might do it because they've seen me in something is, would be great. You know, I hope that has happened once. You know, I don't know if it has. But we'll go find them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be good. And from that point of view, I suppose it's important. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and just thinking about you and your career, and as an actor, and as a, I hate saying st a kind of a star. Like we spoke about you being a jobbing actor and kind of always, always working. But in terms of like British independent film, you know, you could actually argue that you're a star of British ind independent film. You're, you know, you're quite, A, you're prol prolific and you've been in some well-received films such as, you know, Kill List and you work with Ben Wheatley. But when I went to research you, there is very little about Neil Maskell um, in like from interviews, you know, any in, in film culture, or just you know from the any kind of newspaper, and I just wondered whether a you're not interested in being famous, or you are you a bit of a, a reluctant star, or do you just don't like doing interviews? I, do, I find it quite anxiety inducing <laughs> to do interviews. Um, worse than actually acting. I'm, oh, I'm much, going to imagine much worse. so. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, being someone else is fine, and being yourself is awkward. And I, I mean, I was saying to you before we started this interview that it's like the home video thing where it's all fine when you're watching everyone else at the wedding and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And isn't she great? And then it comes around on you and everyone's response is the same, which is yeah. like, oh, God, no, that's me trying to be funny or trying to sound intelligent or whatever it is, you know. Um, but also, I really value my anonymity. Yeah. And so I don't... Um, I mean, it's not like hundreds of people want to interview me all the time. Or people I find that really surprising. Um, yeah, well, sorry, you know, I just, um, I mean, I have so to say I, that. but I do also avoid it a bit if I can. Yeah. You know, so for instance, on the job I'm on now, I'm like, if the other actor can do it and I and they're happy to do it, then I'd rather they did it than I do it, and that's partly because of feeling not wholly comfortable with talking about myself in this way, and it feels very grand to me, and I, I struggle with that. Um, but also because I really like being a, not being very famous. And no, like, you don't want to be recognised. Yeah, I'm happy just walking about and being a normal person and not having all that that baggage. I, I would find I've, I've got friends who are very well known, or very famous, and the constant um, uh, people one of their autographs, sort of talking, recognizing, well, no, yeah. Yeah, or recognizing and, them, and, and recognizing them, they've lost something. You know, they can't sit outside a coffee shop necessarily without being has to sit outside a coffee shop. That bourgeois I've become, but like, <laughs> you know, like or whatever it is, sold you out, know, you sold out. Yeah, I have, yeah, I drink coffee outside these Outrageous. days. Our fresco, <laughs> uh, yeah, but like, you know, that's I'd find that a little bit tiring. I think it's not for me. So you don't want to be the next Bond? Well, they asked and I just said, you know, I said no. Turn them down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that was why they got Daniel Craig to do this one, because it was going to be me, but I just, I don't Good fancy choice. it. I don't fancy it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that part's in the post, to be honest. 
I mean, because you seem, looking at your work, you seem, you're happy to either be in a supporting role, you're happy to be, you know, the, the kind yeah. of the star. It, you know, there doesn't seem to be, you're happy to do not necessarily anything, but your work is really varied. You know, not just in the form from like short film to TV, but the, the, the roles, you know, you take. And if you look back at the last few years, and I was looking, you know, Churchill in Peaky Blinders, and I want to talk to you about, about that. Um, in, you know, in the intergalactic, only wise. Yeah. Yeah. And also, is it Winkle, Wink and Gary? Oh, Winkle, yeah, yeah and Wink and Gary. So you kind of got comedy, because because you you know you would say if if you were talking about your persona and your your star persona, it is for playing very violent, kind of, yeah. you know, psychotic men, killers, hitman, and here you are, you know, Churchill, Ernie Wise, and you know, and in Ken Gary, and I just wondered, is it again, is that you just saying? okay, I want to do something different, or is it just roles that present themselves? King Gary, you look like you're having a ball. It's just... Well, King Gary is a bunch of roles. Is that, is that, because that was another, one of the kind of other questions, whether you like working with friends or, you know, do you, is that a real big kind of pull for you as well? It's just like, and I wondered whether that was for King Gary. Yeah, well, I mean, getting up in the morning and going to work with your pals and also doing something that is funny. And um, and is a laugh, and not just Tom Davis, who's a good mate, and James DeFrond, who directs it, who's like, I mean, James was giving me work, playing very unusual characters. I did a thing called the Morgana Show years ago with Morgana Robinson, yeah. where I was playing an American sort of an old guy with like heavy makeup, playing this old old American man. Um, he was always someone who gave me when the industry had very little interest in me outside of sort of playing lunatics. Um, he gave me lots of opportunities and I'd do anything for James. He was so, so good to me and really looked after me. For so years. it feels like there's an element of like paying it back for you. Oh, like definitely. That's, that's quite important to well, you. Well, not also just paying it back as such, but wanting to be around people that you've worked with and that, you know, that it goes back to the confidence thing, actually, and people showing belief in you. Yeah. You go, oh, well, I'll go back with them because I know they think I can do it. You know, I know that's strange, but... In a, in a game where often, you know, when, you're still, when you've been doing it 20 years and people still want you to audition, or still want you to come in and can you do these lines in your own accent, you know, to play a part that maybe is, I mean, maybe different, but not hugely dissimilar to stuff you've done before. When that's what the game's asking you, and there's someone else who's like, try this, yeah, no, you're hired, come in, do it. Then you're gonna go back and work with those yeah. people again and again. You know, um, and it's not really necessarily just about paying them back. It's because you know they're going to give you the opportunity to play and explore and try things and take risks. Yeah. Um, the 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 other sections of our game wouldn't let you do. Um, and King Gary, yeah. It, I mean, it's not just James and Tom on that. Simon Day is a mate. I love Camille Kaduri. Laura Chetley has become a friend. Um, Sarah McGrillis, who's on it, we did uh, No Offence together, and I love her. That's a great Mark. program. No Offence was a great yeah, series. Yeah, No Offence was, really was, was, yeah. was, was good, you know. I mean, that was a kind of, I know I was playing a, that part was, uh, had more to it than, than you know, uh, stuff, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, Jay Simpson, who's on that, Mark Monero's on that. There's loads of friends on that, Romesh. You know, we're all sort of, we all get on very well, and, and that, that set, you do laugh all day. Like members of the crew, I'm working with this guy, Swiss, at the moment, who's a sound guy. That's the other thing that people don't know. It's not just, you know, Roy Easterbrook, who shoots that, is a mate. You know, they become the crew as well as the cast. You, you go to work and have a laugh every day. I mean, you have to apply yourself and do the work and nail the jokes and stuff like that. But it's a delight to go and do King Gary. Good. Um, I'm really glad to hear you say that. It's, yeah. It is. It is. Um. It's a great program. Oh, it's great fun. It's kind such of, a laugh. And it's yeah. just really kind of feels like underrated as well. Like people, more people should see this kind of you know show. Yeah, I, I think week. it's done quite well. Like this series. Um, I think so. It has. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's kind of on the build a little bit, King Which I'm really glad. I hope we get to do loads more of it because 
yeah, it's just, it's great. Yeah. No, a friend of mine, when the first series came out, rang me and said, you've got to watch it. It's like where we grew up. And I grew up in yeah, like a small yeah. town in Kent. Oh, I was it's like, so oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah go it on, is, King yeah. Harry. Yeah, And absolutely. it's full of subtle jokes to people who are not from that. Will will never get and we won't even see. Absolutely, and it's you know? a classic. And I think like that, and I hate to make a comparison because obviously only fools and horses is you know so, rightly yeah. pedestaled, but it's got <laughs> only fools and always, horses always worked in two ways. It was full of great jokes and also it was full of like small gags that if you didn't know that world a little bit, you didn't get. And I yeah. think King Gary's got lots of that as well. Absolutely, that's yeah. fantastic. I mean, so Churchill and Peaky Blinders, yeah. you know how. Were you offered that? Did it come to you and you're just like, yeah, I want, I want to, want to take you. I mean, how do you end up playing Churchill? So Anthony Byrne, who directs uh, PQ, who's done the last two series of Peaky Blinders, um, was uh, I worked with Anthony. I did an episode years ago of Silent Witness with him. Um, that was a great part actually. Me and Kate McGowan playing husband and wife. And, um, I played someone who killed his whole family in a sort of uh, because his his finances had collapsed, um, but not in the usual. I wasn't <laughs> sort of middle class guy, you know. It was a bit different, and um, and we got on really well, and we hit it off. And he was a brilliant director. And then we did a film together, me, him, Natalie Dormer, Jimmy Cosmo, um, did a film called In Darkness. Yeah. Um, which was a really fun part, kind of in a genre piece, playing this sort of burger chomping cop, you know, like in a trench coat, which I enjoyed because it was very playful. It was set very, it was a contemporary piece and it was set in a sort of realistic world, but it played with genre a lot. And we had a great time on that. And then he called me and said, um, do you want to play Churchill? And I was, I kind of went, really? Like, I did, did you laugh? She's like, Sorry. Yeah, I did a bit. Yeah. And, um, and I said, well, yeah, obviously, I'd like to have a swing at that, you know? And he said, I think it'll be fun. He said, the scripts are fun. And at that point, I didn't even know what he was, what he was in. And he said, it's for Peaky Blinders, which I hadn't seen at that point. And I was like, okay, yeah, great. Had you heard of it, it though? Had you yeah, heard of it? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were on like the third series or something. Yeah. And I knew, um, you know, I know Paul um, Anderson, who was in it, and I know Joe Cole, who was in it, and I know they're great actors. Paul Anderson was in Piggy. Yeah, we and, we and, and you were in Piggy, together, yeah. And we did the great yeah. train robbery together yeah. as well, and, uh, you know, Paul's a great actor. Another um, kind of underrated, you very know. Very underrated. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there seems to be a thread, doesn't there, of these underrated actors about where they come from. Um, but, I kind of think so, yeah, and maybe it's yeah. another conversation, well, but, you know, know I... Yeah, I'm it's kind there, of. Yeah, no, that's think so. you know, and there's a lot that haven't even had the success that myself and Paul haven't had that deserve it and should have had more. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so, and then a strange thing happened actually, and I don't know if I should really say this, but I will. Do. You don't have to. Um, <laughs> was that I started to watch it, and I saw that Andy Nyman, who's a friend, had played Churchill in a previous series, and so. I got in touch with Andy to say like, I didn't know this part was already taken. And if you're, if there's something, cause sometimes you're not treated very well. I mean, Anthony hadn't directed Andy in that part. Right. Um, he, 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 this was from previous series. So, you know, and sometimes the television world and the, the high, you know, these productions don't treat actors very well sometimes. And I said, if anyway, you're being shunted aside, you didn't like, want to, with that kind of... You know what, you'd I say, wouldn't do it. I yeah. said, I haven't signed anything yet and I won't do that. And Andy said, I'm doing Fiddler on the Roof, which has been my dream for years <laughs> to play this part. And I will quote him. He said, grab that cunt with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which I thought was lovely. And then, um, and that was sort of really gave me the, the confidence to, to do it and... Um, and also it was like, oh yeah, this is fun. It's not just, 
you know, obviously there's a lot of pressure and there was a lot of research, more research than I've ever had to do for That's very few scenes. Yeah, because it's well, quite you have a to spot, do the yeah. same amount of work as you would if it was the lead. Yeah. You know, because you can't walk on and not know anything about Churchill and not have studied it and, and tried to... I mean, I didn't want to do, like, the exact voice. His voice is, slight, is quite higher than mine and when you start to get into that realm, it gets ridiculous. So it was about finding... Uh, which was really exciting about it, finding a voice that had enough of him about it, but wasn't kind of trying to do an impression where it becomes ridiculous. Yeah, because that's important about, you know, I mean, there's yeah. lots of things important about Churchill, but in terms of a performance, and it is the voice, and it's interesting to hear you say you didn't kind of do any kind of exact kind of, you know, mimic of it, but you hit it. You know, you there is, yeah. you can... You can listen to go oh, that you know you do sound like Churchill, so yeah, was, was that difficult? Yeah, was that was uh, it difficult getting the voice? Well, it took a while, and then things. It's weird. It's like um, anything. Something just clicks one day where you're going. You know, you panic and you're like, "Oh, this isn't going to work," and oh, I'm not really getting anywhere near it. And that sounds ridiculous and that's stupid. <laughs> and uh, trying to do it exactly that doesn't work. And then at some point, you're like, oh, okay, well, that starts to feel all right. And then they put all the prosthetics on, which are bonkers. That take um, ages. I mean, that cause... Uh, it's about a four and a half because I've done the new series as well, and it's about a four it's and a half hour. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I think I'm fairly sure I can say that. Um, four and a half hours, something like that, to make up. But then once that's on, and the the way the makeup works, it really moves now as well in a way that it didn't even sort of ten years ago. It's very enjoyable once you've done. The, the, the work and the research and got what you think's the voice and the physicality, we actually have quite a laugh when we're doing it, you know? I, I try and have fun with it, really, because, I've you know, what's the point of always, really? And it's not, it's, Peaky Blinders is not a particularly po-faced programme, you know? It's got a lot of humour to it um, and, a, and a sense of fun. There's enough edge and darkness, but tonally, it's it's got a lot of humour as well, it's and it balance. can be quite wildly theatrical on yeah. time. So it's a lot of fun playing that part in that show. Okay. So you enjoy playing. I do, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I love working with Killian, and I love working with Anthony again. And yeah, it was great. I've enjoyed doing all of that stuff. And before we move on, so Ernie, how's it how's it playing Ernie Wise? Was that because that seems a real Ernie was that difficult? Or? That was the most pressure. I think I've felt, and like time pressure as yeah. well. Because even though it was a BBC job, it was filmed on a very low budget, um, an incredibly short amount of time. And it was period, and you're playing very famous people. I mean, I was so lucky with the cast on that, that were working around me, like Mark Bonner's amazing and really hard working and fastidious. And we pushed each other, I think. Yeah. getting ready for it. I mean, he's a really good mate now. I'm working with Mark again now on this Litvinenko thing. But we were quickly friends and quickly collaborators. You know, there wasn't competition there. Um, I've been lucky in that throughout my career, actually, that I've not come into too many actors who see it as a big competition. You know, you do get it occasionally. But who see it as a kind of collaboration. Steve Tompkinson, Alex McQueen, Rubus Jones. There was a good sort of core group there. Um, but it was incredibly pressured and it was really, really hard. Um, I've still never seen it. Oh, right, so, so you still yet to, yet, still yeah, yet to I'll see it. I will do one day. Okay. Um, and I did so, I watched hours and hours and hours and hours of it. Because they're so famous, you know, you think about it. Yeah, you know, exactly. If you, and especially if you watch TV, of a yeah. certain age you watch TV, you would know these two. That was the, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think I've experienced fear like that. Um, about a part, even Churchill. Even Churchill, um, wow. As I did about playing Ernie Wise. I hope we got close. I mean, what I've heard about it is really good. And Mark's always like, what do you mean you haven't seen it? <laughs> He's really happy with it. He's like, it's great, it really worked. We, you know, we, we, we worked out in it and stuff. Um, but yeah, that was, that was really, really, really tough. Um, yeah, scary. So just that kind of leads into my next question um, about whether you a reflect on your career, whether you look at your roles, um, and I know you said before, it's, yeah. you know, you're not too fond of actually watching yourself. And I, I, I just, I just wondered, you know, do you, when you come out of, of a role, do you reflect on how that, how that's been? You know, how, do you have a favourite role or a film, you know, a role or um, 
a kind of film or TV that has been the biggest challenge. I mean, you said about Ernie, that was that yeah. seemed to be a tougher um, thing to, rather than, you know, in comparison to Churchill. And you talk, I mean, you've spoken a lot about confidence and I just wonder, you know, A, are you confident in your ability or is it, are you, do you always have, do you have doubts? I mean, I've read an interview about, you were talking about um, your role in Utopia and you, there was, you know, like a worry about people just thought that was just you, you know, you should just walk, you know. And I just wondered, A, do you reflect on your kind of past roles? Do you think, okay, this worked well, that didn't work well? Do you look back and think, I really enjoyed that? That was that was me at the top of my game. Do you, you know? Do you do you have that engagement with your career, or is it just on to the next job, on to the next job, on to the next job? It's mainly on to the next job. I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm. I don't think I've got the objectivity to go. Oh yeah, I was good in that, or that part was good. Are you but too modest? Definitely. I've, I'm not. I've. I've said it before before as well before we started this like you know I've got an ego like anyone you know I think I'm pretty good at it I don't you know and I wouldn't have sort of cracked on as I have if I couldn't do it you know and in that sense it's like playing an instrument or something you go well I can do this I know what I'm doing you know but always probably feel afterwards that you could have done it differently better and acting such an intangible thing you know it's not like wiring up a plug or, or to, <laughs> where you go well I've done it there it is you know I've built this house and it's easy you know and, it, and, it, and it's a nice house to live in you kind of can always go oh I could have done that differently I should have changed that and I always think a few months later it really kind of jarred Paul Andrew Williams when I was like I just got it wrong and it was like a few <laughs> months later is that for Paul? Is yeah that for which I feel differently again about now now I'm like and that was before I'd seen it and stuff and I you know just you always think you could have done it differently, whether it's RB and YouTube, whatever it is. You always think, oh man, you know, when we've on Kill List, I begged Ben Wheatley, I mean, ridiculously, because you've never got the time to do this, to reshoot all of the stuff that we did in the house at the beginning, because we shot everything in the house with me and Miana in the first four days. And in no way is that a reflection on Miana. Because um, I was like, oh no, I messed it up. And, uh, and he was like, no, it's good. I like it. Shut up. Stop <laughs> talking about it. Um, so I always feel like that. But if I do, like mainly if I have any kind of reflection on my career, I think, well, Kill this changed everything. I was going to ask, you it know, was that, that's like the biggest thing. Yeah. After yeah. That. And that was really about how the film was received. You know, people liked it. And for all sorts of reasons that are outside everyone's control, that might not have been seen or might not have had the success. if. Down Terrace hadn't have got some success and some heat in the right area, you know, the evening standard like it and some of the more arty crowd think something <laughs> of it. So all of a sudden you're in that kind of realm and, and the critics are uh, more receptive to, to the work. Um, Were you surprised by the success? Well, I thought it was good. Uh, the, I knew the process had been good and I knew Ben was like super talented and, and the actors that I'd worked with, Miana and Smiley, uh, and, and Emma were, were just amazing people. And, I, and I'd been through a process, you know, Laurie Rose and Nick Gillespie who shot it, everyone, Bobby Entwist, who on sound. There was like, these people are a Real talented, yeah, know? yeah. Um, so I knew it was good, but I couldn't have dreamed really of, of what, how much it would change the industry's perception and how then all of a sudden people who wouldn't have given me the time of day were offering me sizable roles. So it yeah. changed it? So it, do you yeah, think it, it's, it's like, like a turn, not say kind of turning point, but it, it kind of shifted. It's more than a turning more point. Than, so it really, Night and day. so that's like that, in, in terms of everything, you know, yeah. that is the one kind of thing where everything really shifted. Yeah, yeah. 100%. You know, I mean, as you say, I was getting work always in- Always busy. Turn, yeah, and yeah, in, yeah, in certain kinds of films and with groups of people I'd worked with before and, you know, but there were always, despite, some of them, you know, having a lot of quality or, or, or being better than others or whatever. Um, and working with brilliant people on those kind of B-movies, if you like, or whatever you want to call them, you know, that appeal to the audience we were talking about before. Yeah. I work with brilliant people in, in those as well, but they're just not recognised or they're dismissed by the same critics that love B-movies from America and Roger Corman films and all this that. Is, this but the is ones the in Britain, yeah. they're no good and they're, you know, yeah. it, um, the, the the double standards are really mind blowing sometimes, but um, 
you know, that, yeah, that, it being taken to the heart of the critical set and stuff meant that, you know, and I was no better actor the day after Kill List was released than I was the day before it was released. And all of a sudden, you know, the parts just got a lot more varied in a lot, or in a lot more varied work and a lot more high profile work and that begets other stuff. So it kind of gave you the kind of next momentum to kind of yeah. to where you are now. Yeah. Okay. So you said earlier, I was reading an interview with you and you, you said, I'd be quite happy just to be able to do a short film a year, a play a year and a film a year and, you know, you'd be happy with that. And I was just wondering, a, I have an art and already. And direct. And direct, yes. Yeah. So we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Don't worry, we'll come to that. But, you know, are you quite modest? I mean, there is a, the, the, the one thing that's kind of lacks when your CV is um, Hollywood. And I just wondered whether, A, you've got any interest in going, in going to Hollywood. I mean, you have a... You, you have a hugely successful career, but you know, do you have like modest ambitions? You know, are you quite happy to be that jobbing actor? I mean, you said you're not interested in being really famous. Yeah. You know, don't want to be not Daniel Craig or, or Bond. And but I are you was kind joking of, when I said that. I, I, you know, I wasn't quick, I don't know. <laughs> But you know, um, I just are you, are you kind of happy where you are with your career? I'm really happy. Yeah. I'm really. I I see my good fortune because some of the best actors I've ever worked with, who I, honestly, people I'm not fit to lace their boots, have never been recognised and never had the opportunity I've had and haven't had their kill list. It's that, that opportunity, it's the I opportunity. think is what you're saying, yeah. And it's the, you know, it's just landing in the right place in the industry that's still run by the Oxbridgians and the, you know, the Goldsmiths and, and um, Martins people and all that and you know it's like yeah who don't get the opportunity I see my good fortune I see the result that I've had I've seen like how weekly's um, changed my life essentially um, so yes I'm very happy with that things have gone beyond my wildest hopes really the fact that I'm still working now I didn't necessarily think I'd still manage to be an actor you know really by the time I got to 45 which is what I am now um, and yeah I mean I'd love to do you know, I, I mean, I don't... It's not a conscious just, decision and not to go to no, Hollywood. No, I mean, it's I'd just... love to do Hollywood movies and stuff. And I've done it, you know, I've done a couple of big, bigger films. I did the uh, guy, Richie's King Arthur and... The Mummy. I did a little bit on The Mummy. I got sort of cut out The Mummy, really. But And I might work with Alex Kurtzman again, who directed that, because we got on very well and we've, yeah. we've talked um, again about possibly doing something together. And I'd love to do a bit, but I definitely... For a start, I, I wouldn't like to live in America, and um, and yeah, I I feel like pretty content. If things remain as they are, and I'm sure they won't forever, and I'm sure that there will still be periods where, you know, there's there's less work or whatever. But if, if things remain how they are now, then I'm a very 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 happy man. My life is in a place where I'm very happy as well. So I'm incredibly fortunate. I mean, who can say that? You know, yeah. it's it's really good luck above any kind of decision making, talent, abilities. You know, all of that stuff. Hopefully, I've got a bit of those things. But what I've got mainly is good fortune. I've been so lucky. You know. So talking about good fortune, let's talk about your debut directing. As it's a feature film, so I know you've done it's shorts for film. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, how did that come about? You, you know, you said earlier when we spoke off camera about it's kind of, it felt like it's been a long time coming or there's been a gestation kind of period for it. So how did that kind of come into being? What made you decide, okay, I want to direct something? I know you've directed in theatre and, you know, was that, you know, um, kind of a motivation, but how did this come, how did this project come into being? Uh, I wrote it some time ago and I've uh, been trying to get it made for a long time, trying to raise the money. Um, and then uh, the producers, Helen Simmons and Steph Aspin, picked it up through Andy Stark mm -hmm. at Rook Films, who works with Ben a lot. Um, and they managed to get Mar Vista involved, they're an American company who put the money in. Um, it didn't hurt at all that Tom Burke, who's a a great actor and also a friend wanted to be involved and Jenna Coleman signed on for it who were the the 
we, you need well-known faces to get a film made and they also happen to be exactly right for the parts and you know they are great in it I haven't quite finished it yet but it's nearly finished um, so yeah it took a while to get it up and running but that was the route really I mean I, yeah I wrote it some time ago and how was the how was directing for you I mean you know you talk about you know kind of confidence and you yeah. kind of speak a lot about how as an actor that relationship with the director is important how was that transition for you to kind of you know to go behind the camera well I sort of applied exactly that way of thinking um, an ethos to directing which was I've got great actors so let them do it and if I need something a little bit I might you know very slightly nudge them I've got a great DP, Nick Gillespie, who, he knows where to put the camera. You know, I, I, you I tried to... had confidence in him, that all about confidence, confidence in him. Yeah. An amazing first assistant director, Mick Wald, who I've been lucky enough to work with before and knew how to run a set. You know, Lex Wood, who designed the costumes, an incredible costume design. It was like, in a, you know, Bobby Entwistle again, who did Kill List, was, the, yeah. was sound, and Martin Pavey did the sound design on it. it was, Possibly the, the best sound designer in the country, you know, he's worked with Ben and Peter Strickland. So I, you know, the composer on it, Andy Shortwave, or as I know, is Andrew Pettit. Um, these people are like megawatt talents. So I saw it much more as a gathering of the talents than I did of something that I was driving as some sort of alter. You know what I mean? I so another like, kind of collaboration for yeah, you. Yeah, just of a big like, collaboration. Really and like, People you could trust, people that, that you've trust. worked with before. Yeah. And people I know are brilliant. Yeah. And just pulling them all together and, and getting them on the, you know, on the truck and sort of getting it off and running and, and listening and leaning into their best endeavours. That's the route. And if it works, then great. And I hope I get to do it again because that's my whole ethos, really, is get people who are good and lean in. You know, and and that's hopefully it's worked out. I think it has. Is that your? Would you say that's like, if not a principle, and like your approach to work for to you? To art. To art. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Completely. Okay. So I'm going to leave it to you to um to <laughs> to to pronounce the name of your film because I think yes. you can probably pronounce it better than I can. Uh, the film's called Clock and Ladder. And it's a and it's comedy. It's a comedy. It's a sort of black comedy. Um, it's sort of dressed up as a, a political thriller, but it's a character chamber piece as well, really. And um, I hope people think it's funny and I hope they like it, they find it compelling. Um, uh, and there is an element of sort of politics in it that I'm hopefully sneaking under the, <laughs> um, under the wire as well. And um, I was actually asked the other day, the producers were like, shorthand, did you see Citizen for the, the Edward Snowden documentary. Yes, yeah. They were like, if we um, if we have to say it's this meets that, what is it? And I think it's Citizen Four meets the Muppet Show. <laughs> yeah. That's my best pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what's the so the title? What's the meaning of the title? Uh, Clock and Litter is. Um, it means, the direct translation of it from Flemish is bell ringer, but they use that as the expression we would use is whistleblower. Whistleblower, okay. So it's about a kind of government whistleblower, like a Snowden kind of character. And how do you feel, I mean, you know, saying it, talking about it being a black comedy, you know, that light horror, they are difficult genres to, um, to do. I wondered whether you had any any kind of anxiety about my first feature film, I want to make a comedy or, you know, did you worry about that? I mean, could you talk about, you know, I confidence would have done a lot? I thought about it, yeah. Probably. So good job you hadn't met me before then, yeah, really, probably. but I pointed it out and just gone. It would have made me nervous. I'm oh, sorry. Or more nervous, not that I wasn't nervous. <laughs> I won't, no, I won't, terrible. Okay, I won't, I won't ask any kind of yeah. more questions about comedy. But, um, so, we're gonna, we've been talking a long time. Yeah. Um, so we're going to wrap up now, but thinking about what's what's next. When when is the film out, and then what's next for you? Um, I'm hoping the film will get a release. I suppose next year. I don't know when yet because we're not quite finished yet. So that will be down to sales agents and the distributors and stuff like that. I hope that it will play a couple of festivals first. Would be nice. Um, so yeah, and then 
There's a couple of things. Uh, I've been talking to Dominic Tybit, who produced Ball, about the possibility maybe of putting a very small film together, something hopefully um, very different from Clock and Litter. And I've got a couple of projects for television that I've written, that, um, one of which I'd like to direct and something else that I'd like uh, Kieran Hawks, who directed Intergalactic, to, to direct, because he's a good friend and someone that I think I would like to collaborate with in that way. Um, so yeah, there's that. And then I'm doing this thing at the moment. Um, so I've just done a film for the National Theatre that Clint Dyer directed, mm -hmm. who's another person I wanted to work for years. Him and Roy Williams wrote, that's um, an extension of their Death of England series of plays. Uh, the third one in the series, that's, uh, it was two one-man shows, one with Rafe Spall, one with Michael Balligan, that both happened at the National. Yeah. We've just done a two-hander, me and Joel's Torreira, for Sky Television that we shot on stage at the National. So that's coming out on the 24th. How was that? November. That was great. It was it was as much as I've ever been pushed as a, an actor, actually. So it's quite challenging. Um, very challenging. Yeah. Clint is a really um, forensic director who really makes you work, um, uh, who's, who's pushing at like, the boundaries of the people that he's So really push you, like, push, like to push yourself? Yeah, well, we could do a two-hander anyway that was kind of more like a play. Him and Roy Williams had written it and it was so the dialogue was like nothing I've ever had to learn before and huge monologues. My first day on set, the first setup on the first take was a six-page monologue where I was playing myself and Giles and in a conversation that happened supposedly earlier on, and I'm playing him and me, like one line, one line, one line. And then I'm talking directly to the camera, commenting on the conversation we were having. And that was six pages, like six or seven minutes long. And that was the first set up on the first day. And that wasn't the toughest thing I had to do. So it was incredibly difficult. And I really hope it's come out well. I haven't seen it yet. Will but you see it or will you? Is, is it going to be one of those it. that you're going to leave it oh, for a few years oh, and then come back to it? I need to because otherwise I've just, I, I have a tendency, and this is all probably my ego, uh, is that I, I just hate it if I see it too, too close to when I did it. If I've got a bit of distance, I don't always love it when I see it with a bit of distance, <laughs> but at least I can be a little bit objective about it. Are you too critical of yourself? Is that is that one of the reasons why you just think I don't want to watch this? I don't know if I'm this. too critical. I am critical you of myself, critical. but I don't, know, I don't think it's necessarily too critical. <laughs> <laughs> it's like like um, it's like a Craig, Craig Fairbrass. You are critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah you are critical. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, you spoke for all the Craig. Um, and then I've, I'm doing a, a series for ITV about the murder of Alexander Litvinenko um, with Mark Bonner and mm. um, David Tennant and Margarita Leveva. That's great. Really, George K wrote it. Wrote Lupin, and um, it's a brilliant script. Four parter, very intense, very political, very inflammatory and challenging. Great part. Um, so yeah, well, I'm filming that at the moment, and that'll be on next year. Okay. At some point. So quite busy. And yeah, yeah, still quite planned. busy. Yeah, You're still, yeah, still yeah, that job being, still job being actor. So yeah. my last question is. Um, do you think much about the future? Do you think, I mean, it doesn't, you know, talking to you about your career, about how, you know, the good fortune and the luck of the opportunity has been a real, you know, a driver or, you know, that's how you kind of put down the successes or the, the turns of your career. Do you have any plans for the future? Is it something that you just see what comes along? Or when I mean, you talk about writing and I just wondered whether, you know, have you thought about I'd rather move into directing or writing, maybe not do so much acting, or you just don't plan like that. And I just, you know, what in the next five years, you know, where would you like to see yourself the next kind of five years? Apart from obviously like James Bond, because, you oh, know, yeah. or, um, you know, living well, in LA. Well, I already but... told you, I'm, uh, I've said no. <laughs> Whether they come back, I don't know, they might offer me more money. Maybe Miss um, Money Penny then, maybe yeah, you could yeah, like yeah, to swap that around. That'd be a know? great yeah. Miss Money Penny. Um, well, yeah, where, do, I mean, you know, do you think about where you'd like to see yourself or do you just think it's just, it's just more, as it comes? Yeah, I would definitely like to write more. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's something. But beyond that, I don't have sort of very specific goals because I I know by now that it's foolish in this game. <laughs> to, 
So it's probably foolish in any game in life, isn't it, to be kind yeah. of too prescriptive about what you think you're going to be doing in the future. But um, do you like that as well? Do you like having that bit of uncertainty, like what comes along? Yeah, do you think? I suppose. I mean, it's also scary, but yeah, I think so. I mean, I I chose this life, you know, and and it, it isn't safe, and it isn't, you know, you you're always kind of out hanging on and waiting for other people a lot of the time and seeing what work might come your way and it's tentative and it's tenuous and scary sometimes. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I must I must want it to be that way, I suppose, otherwise I wouldn't still be here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Neil Maskell, thank you so much um, for the, taking the just, time. I've really enjoyed, you know, um, like talking to you about your career yeah, I and your honesty. I don't normally enjoy well. doing it, and I've really enjoyed it. And just, Good. it's. I think Britflix is great, and I really appreciate the support of um, not just my work, but of the work of. I think there's there aren't very many websites, organisations that are really committed in the way that Britflix is to supporting work, publicising work, getting work that isn't recognised out there. And I feel honoured that you would ask me to come and do this kind of retrospective thing, because I think it's, I think it's a fantastic thing and I feel very proud to, uh, to, to lend my little bit of shoulder to the wheel, you know? Thank you, Neil. Thanks Thank so, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.